When we see spaceships in sci-fi like the Enterprise accelerate to half the speed of light in a matter of seconds, we often take it for granted just how miraculous this kind of thing is. Fans of sci-fi often lose their sense of perspective relative to the real world, especially if you consider what we know about physics and engineering in our current primitive age. Probably one of our most efficient and high-yield forms of energy production today is a nuclear reactor. One nuclear reactor in the United States outputs on average about one gigawatt of power. And that's kind of a lot. One gigawatt is a billion watts. And to put that into perspective, that's about 100 million LED bulbs, 1.3 million horses, or 2,000 Corvette Z06s. And yes, this all seems like a lot, but compared to the potential power of a real starship from Star Trek, even a lower tech one, it's quite laughable. It was stated in the Next Generation episode True Q, the Enterprise D could generate 12.75 billion gigawatts, and that's about 12 billion nuclear power plants. Obviously, those ships are using a different power source in the form of matter, antimatter, but still... In this case, we'll use uh, the old movie era Enterprise to make some fun calculations. So how much does it really take to power a starship? Let's focus on three abilities for this Enterprise that we can easily calculate the power requirements for according to modern physics. And then the fourth gets a bit harder and steeped in exotic theories. The three tasks are the ability to reach almost the speed of light at impulse, the ability to use energy shields for defense, and the ability to fire weapons, in this case phasers. The first task, reach 0.9 times the speed of light, is pretty straightforward. That is, before we throw in special relativity, which we will do later. In that case, we start with the formula for kinetic energy of the object. In joules, which 1 joule equals 1 watt, so that makes it easy, kinetic energy equals 1 half the mass times velocity squared. The target velocity is 0.9 c, or 0.9 of 299,792, 458 meters per second. And that comes out to 269 million 813,212 meters per second. If we calculate this for just one kilogram for now, that comes out to this number in watts, but we want to convert that to a gigawatt, which is a billion watts. So we divide that by a billion and it comes out to 36,399,584.7 gigawatts, but that's only for one gram. For a metric ton, we have to multiply times a thousand, and that comes out to 36,399,584,738 gigawatts. And consider that this enterprise could be around 200,000 tons. This isn't really stated in canon anywhere. We're just kind of using modern warships for reference here. The weight of this enterprise could be a lot more, could be a lot less. We have no idea what 23rd century materials would actually weigh. But we'll just go with 200,000 metric tons for now. So we take the 36 billion number above and multiply that times 200,000 tons, and that comes out to about 727,991,690,000,000. So yeah, that's about 728 trillion nuclear reactors. That's quite a bit. However, according to special relativity, it takes a lot more energy to reach higher velocities the closer you are to the speed of light, and 0.9c will definitely cause some relativity issues. So, yeah, we gotta get into some relativistic equations now, and we just happen to have one right here for calculating the energy at relativistic speeds for mass. And by the end of the day, we come up with 23 quadrillion, 262 trillion, 612 billion gigawatts of energy. So, yeah, that's a lot. Even more than what they stated was possible for the Enterprise D. So how can even they possibly come up with that much power? Well, they probably can't, even with a matter-antimatter reactor. And this is where we just delve into highly theoretical physics that our technology is not able to manifest. We will touch on that briefly a bit later. So now, how about shields? Those of you familiar with this channel may have seen my earlier video on real-world shield physics. The primary shields of Star Trek ships are most likely magnetoplasma shields, which is a super hot plasma wall controlled by magnetic fields. It's so hot you wouldn't be able to see it with the naked eye. And this can be made to deflect or disintegrate objects that collide with it. 
We already have something like this today. These high energy plasma fields are used on tokamaks, which compress plasma and attempt to get a good fusion reaction. Of course, the power released from tokamak fusion reactors at this stage is still less than the power put into them to charge all that plasma, but we can take this and apply it to shield technology very much like what you would find in Star Trek. Let's take the latest known tokamak reactor that is to be built called ITER. The ITER toroid will have a radius of only 6.2 meters and a volume of 840 cubic meters. This is quite small compared to the coverage needed to protect a starship. The electrical requirements of this ITER plant will range from 110 megawatts up to 620 megawatts for peak periods. Okay, so that's almost an entire nuclear power plant. Well, let's assume the Enterprise needs to project a shield of much greater surface area and volume. I mean, the whole ship is around 300 meters, for this particular one anyway. The entire volume of the ship does not need to be encompassed. We just need to project a surface area that's perhaps a meter thick. We can kind of use a box surface area formula to roughly calculate how much we're going to need. And if we're looking at a ship that's about 335 meters by 76 by 76 meters, we're looking at about 100,000 square meters to cover here. And that's about 120 times the plasma area of the ITER reactor. And the ITER reactor requires 620 megawatts, so that's more than half a gigawatt. 620 megawatts times 120 is 74,400 megawatts. So we're looking at about 7.4 gigawatts for Enterprise's shield or about seven nuclear power plants. However, the shields of a starship may be many times stronger than the tokamak plasma field, but I have to admit there are probably tons of equations and simulations that could be conducted to figure out just how strong this plasma shield has to be to deflect or disintegrate something like, say, an incoming asteroid, to say nothing about some kind of weapon. This is where some of you nerds in the comments might have the time to hash this out if you want to, and I would really encourage that. But overall, a very basic plasma shield may only require enough power to compare to about a dozen nuclear power plants or so. Well, isn't that nice? All right, now let's move on to some phasers. Phasers are a directed energy weapon, almost certainly a type of particle weapon or particle beam. And there are many types of particle beams. There's the Large Hadron Collider, for example, that accelerates subatomic particles at near the speed of light. Of course, the type and charge of the particles matters a lot, especially for keeping the beam cohesive. In Star Trek, rather than shooting protons or electrons or other types of particles, phasers use a particle called a nadion. Now, we aren't going to get into the physics of phasers in the video. We certainly can say that phasers are probably a large particle accelerator that uses magnetic fields or lensing devices to focus the beams and the twist here is that the nadions are insanely destructive and cohesive particles. The Large Hadron Collider uses 200 megawatts of power when running operations, which is quite a bit for our standards, but perhaps somewhat small by Star Trek standards. And it's pretty clear that a starship like the Enterprise can channel a very large portion of all its power into these weapons. So we could be talking many dozens of gigawatts here. Why only dozens? So this leads us to the final conundrum about Star Trek technology. While it's true that the Enterprises uses a matter-antimatter annihilation for its power source, our current physics today cannot output much more than about four times that of a regular fission reactor. And let's consider that it may be the case that these starships do not need as much power as we think they might to brute force their way into doing what they do. But instead, they finesse it. With the warp drive, for example, the relativistic restrictions on speed are bypassed by creating a warp bubble. Ways to counter inertia and even mass have been devised. Today's physics is still missing a few tricks that will be required to devise not more powerful ways of powering our ships, but smarter ways of accomplishing what seems to be the impossible. Thank you for watching, Space Friends. I threw this video together extremely fast due to somewhat low numbers this month. I'm going to get over my inherent shyness soon and do some live streaming, so subscribe and get the notification for that. And I really appreciate anyone who can support this channel through Patreon, which has 3D model assets and some renders, and I've been remiss about putting my vids on there ad-free. It's time to start doing that, isn't it? Special thanks to recent Patreon additions, Jonathan, Dustin Hatchett, and uh, RajBro03. 
and everyone else who's been a longtime supporter there. Hope everyone is having a great summer. Now stay tuned for retakes. 36 billion 399 comes out retake 36 billion 399,584 retake about 727 billion no, no, no. just how strong this plasma shield has to be to deflect or the second retake so this leads us to the final conundrum about star trek technology retake so this kind of leads us to the final conundrum about Star Trek retake. So this leads us to the final conundrum about Star Trek retake.